Hi, my name is Concetta Tomei, and I played Minister Odala on Star Trek Voyager, and I'm a guest on Trek Untold. Welcome back to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I am your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. This week, I had the pleasure of chatting with the wonderful Conchetta Tomei. Trekkies will remember Conchetta from her role as Minister Odala from the third season Star Trek Voyager episode titled Distant Origin. Here, she played the leader of the Voth, an alien species that may or may not have roots to Earth's dinosaurs. It's a great episode, a must-watch for any Voyager fan, especially if you haven't seen it in a long time. Beyond Star Trek, though, Conchetta has worked on and off Broadway, as well as theaters across the country in some exciting roles, plus dozens of characters on television and in movies. You may have seen Conchetta previously in Arrested Development, King of Queens, Judging Amy, Murphy Brown, Nip and Tuck, Cold Case, Touched by an Angel, Diagnosis Murder, Max Headroom, and so much more. Conchetta also has a great Star Trek connection, starring alongside Robert Picardo in China Beach. She's another performer who scarcely does interviews, especially ones as long and in-depth as mine tend to be. So this was a real chance to get to know about this very experienced and most excellent performer and understand the lessons Conchetta has learned through life that shape the person she is today. There's so much good info in this episode, and I can't wait for you to dig into it. So without further ado, it's time to spend some time with the magnificent Conchetta Tomei. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you to follow Trek Untold on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold, all one word. You can get show updates, check out some fun memes, and let me know what you think about what's going on with the current events in the Star Trek universe. You can also support this show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash Trek Untold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can listen to the shows before they come out, know about my guests well in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, get transcripts of these episodes to make sure you get all the info, and more benefits coming soon, including watch parties and live streams. But that's all dependent on more fans like you coming over and letting me know you want to be a part of events like that. If you want some Trek Untold merchandise, check out our store for gear and apparel, including shirts, hats, stickers, water bottles, notebooks, and a whole lot more. New designs will be added throughout the year, so it's always worth taking a peek. Trek Untold also has an Amazon shop where you can peruse everything Star Trek, sci-fi, and geeky on Amazon in one convenient location. If you're looking for a gift for the Trekkie in your life, or maybe want to see some of my favorite non-Star Trek things that you can get for yourself, Check out the link for my Amazon shop in the show notes on the audio version and in the description below this video on YouTube. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platforms that allow for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review to help out this show. If you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com at Trek Untold and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. All of these things help more people find this show and to continue growing and bringing you awesome guests each and every week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now across the screen from me, she is a renowned performer of stage and screen. But for many Star Trek fans out there, you might not recognize her without 10 pounds of dinosaur makeup on. Today, we are very grateful to have us being joined by Conchetta or Concetta Tomei. Miss Tomei, Mrs. Tomei, how are you, ma'am? Miss Tomei, uh, fine. I'm actually Mrs. Moltar, but that's Norman, who has been doing all this tech stuff on my end. But um, I'm fine, darling, and how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you to Norman as well, because we've been trying to get this interview going for a little while now. We have <laughs> all sorts of tech problems, but we're here. The fans are ready to hear from you. So I'm super, super excited to chat with you today. Good. Same here, Matthew. Same here. So uh, let me begin with the first question I love to ask all my guests, and that's uh, Conchetta, 
What's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Were you a fan of it at all when it was initially airing? Oh, yeah. Well, back in Wisconsin, you know, um, uh, television at that time, <laughs> in, in the dinosaur age, uh, Matthew uh, was, of course, the main entertainment. You know, no one went to these rock concerts or uh, the stadiums in Chicago or whatever to see uh, concerts. So television was the main thing. And, yeah, it was, I remember watching Star Trek uh, a lot, you know, um, as a young girl. And um, Captain Kirk, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. That's amazing, all those many years ago. But I wasn't, to be perfectly honest, um, I thought I found it fascinating, the whole background, the whole history of it, and then it continued with even more history. And I thought, my God, these writers have to really research, you know, because they can't just, you know, phone it in, as they say. They had to really know what the heck they were talking about. So um, I had a lot of fun as a young girl watching this, watching. And then it just went, the new generation, Star Trek, and then the new generation, and the Voyager, and then Deep Space Nine. It went on and on and on. And, and these writers, I so admire the writers on these shows, because you have to sit down and make things work accurately for that whole world, that Star Trek world. So, yeah, I was a fan. Mm. I never thought I'd ever be on uh, a Star Trek, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so it was a, a shock to me that I actually got this role. I auditioned for it, and um, I was in shock even more when I got into the makeup chair. But other than that, <laughs> I was very excited. It was a great, great experience. It was three days of filming. Hey, we're going to get back to that in a little bit because we got a whole other bunch of things to get through first. Uh, okay, my dear. Uh, I'd love to actually ask a little bit more background about yourself, if you don't mind. Uh, so I'd like to hear where you were born, who your parents were, and what they did. And what did little Concetta or Conchetta, I can't decide what to call you now, so I'm just going to call you, I'm going to stick with Miss Tomei. Uh, what did Miss Tomei want to be when she grew up? <laughs> now, Matthew, don't you dare call me Miss Tomei. Just call me Concetta. That's the American. <clears throat> and if you're more at home with Conchetta, the Italian, that's fine. Either way is okay. Um, I was born and raised in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin which is right between Milwaukee and Chicago. Um, my father was uh, a law enforcement officer in Kenosha. Uh, my mother was a housewife, but a very well-read housewife because she had the time to do it. She didn't have a job, but her job was taking care of me and my dad and um, her family who happened to be in, you know, um, nursing homes or assisted living. And she was the caregiver for all of them. Um, I had a wonderful, wonderful childhood in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and I have great good friends uh, who I'll have to ask to tune in uh, to your Trek Untold uh, today um, when you can give me the information. So um, a normal, very normal childhood. My mother's family were all educators, the Bertellis. That was my mother's maiden name, B-R-I-T-T-E-L-L-I. -L -L -I. The Bertellis were all teachers. My uncle Leonard, my dad, my mother's uh, uh, brother, was superintendent of schools. Uh, there were all junior high school teachers, uh, coaches, high school teachers, superintendent of schools, Michael Len, Bertelli. And then I went into teaching because I went into the University of Wisconsin. That was my background in teaching. And so, as my mother said, she knew I wanted to be an actress in 16, but my mother said, you got to have a you got to have something to fall back on, Holly. And the reason she called me Holly, then you're going to be even more confused, Matthew, <laughs> is that I was born five days after Christmas, December 30th, so my middle name is Holly. Okay. Oh, so all my Midwestern friends, all my gal pals and uh, guy pals in the Midwest call me Holly, all my family. But in theater or film, uh, they call me Concetta or Conchetta. But I then went to the University of Wisconsin just for the backup <laughs> in case I didn't get a job acting. And that was, you know, it was a long shot, to be perfectly honest. But I did have a degree. Um, I have a degree at the University of Wisconsin in um, communications and in teaching, okay, uh, junior high school teaching. And I taught four years in Wisconsin. I taught in Fox Point. I taught... Uh, in Muskego, and I taught uh, two years in Fox Point and one year in Kenosha. 
So I taught a total of four. And then I just said, I have to, I, I have to follow my dream. So go back to my mom and dad and say, I've got to follow this dream. I can't do this anymore. So my dad said, okay, I guess I have to go back to work and get a part-time job. So um, another part-time job. So he did. And then I auditioned for the Goodman School of Drama in Chicago. And my mother, my dad's people are from Rome. And my mother's people are from Calabria. As are t uh, Tanchely, uh, Stanley Tucci's mother and father are also Calabrese. Very interesting. You know, I didn't know you were a teacher beforehand. So that's, that's yes. really cool. Yeah, but I get fan mail, if you can believe this, all these years from students. Oh, wow. I mean, I have, it's just amazing. Yeah, they'd say they look online or they go to YouTube, see what, you know, now when I did China Beach or Providence, whatever they knew at that time. But now all you have to do is go on this this great big screen and uh, go to those YouTube videos and, or Google or IMDb. And a lot of them follow my, have been following my career, which is really, it blows me away. I mean, I get lovely letters, fan letters. They go to Innovative, my agency, and Steve Lamana set up this meeting, my fabulous agent, Steve Lamana. And uh, I get all of this fan mail, not only from, you know, Star Trek for Minister Odala, but just because <laughs> I taught my kids who are, and I won't say their ages, but it's amazing. I've been, I'm very honored to have had two careers and the teaching one no longer, but it keeps alive by all those lovely students who um, email, text me, or write me letters of what they remembered in my classroom. And I taught drama as well in the junior high schools. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, now, do you remember what your first professional gig was? Once you made my very, it clear. my very per first professional. Um, yeah. Do you remember what it was? And uh, let's say what you learned from that first time performing. My first professional, um, I would have to say, would be oh, when I got my equity card and, and then went to New York City. Uh, my first professional job was The Elephant Man and uh, on Broadway. And I understudied Carol Shelley. And I then took over Mrs. Kendall and worked with David Bowie as the Elephant Man. So I worked with Bowie on the Broadway National Tour for like three months. And what a gentleman he was. Uh, what I learned from that is everything I've ever learned uh, on television. And thank you for saying I'm renowned. I don't know if I am. Um, and it's not important. But what is important is that I love what I do, and um, I'm honored that people tune in and enjoy what I do. So I just think of myself as a working actor. Um, so uh, I learned a lot in that first Broadway play, but everything that I learned for television or film, Matthew, I learned on stage. That's where all of the, the, the huge... I think that's where an actor's education begins is on those boards. For me, they were anyway, because yeah. um, I didn't begin in television or film. I began on a theater stage and I was lucky to do four Broadway shows and about nine off Broadway shows and some theater, um, you know, some amateur theater in um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Milwaukee players. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from the boards, the theater work. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Elephant Man. I didn't realize that was your very first professional gig because I, I wanted to ask you questions about that because, you know, I am a big David Bowie fan. Uh, I feel like David was such uh, an amazing artist that maybe people didn't realize how skilled he was at everything he he did. Uh, right. And Elephant Man, and there are some clips of it online. There's some interviews with him from that time period as well. Uh, it was a genius work. So, I mean, uh, did, did you get a chance to like really learn much from him as well when you were performing with him? He was, you know, he was a generous actor and, um, I've been very lucky to work with a number of generous actors. The boy, I had not really, you know, known the 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 expanse of this this man's career and who he was. And you know, I my mother when I first when I auditioned, I got it. My mother said, "Well, Holly, he wears a dress, and I hope that you're going to be able to wear the dress, not <laughs> David Bowie." And I said, "No, mother, that's just." That was Ziggy Stardust, and that was a film that he did. And, you know, I mean, we were just not savvy 
into Bowie. Then, of course, when I started working with him and then saw his unbelievable body of work, and genius is it. But the nicest thing about Bowie was that he was just a sweet man. Mm. Conan, I had spoken to Conan O'Brien about him a long time ago. I was at the Geffen Theater and watching a play. And um, I said, you know, when he was on your show, Mr. O'Brien, you had, you had said, and after he passed away, I did a little mem memorial on his show. And he, you said he was a sweet man. And that you nailed it to the T. He was a sweet man. And he was also a gentleman. He shared the stage. Now, this guy was a consummate performer, Matthew. Yeah. And he just shared the stage with whomever he was with on stage doing those scenes. And that, when I say that he was a generous actor in that regard, it was a scene that you were in with him. He yeah. was alone in those scenes. Bowie had a way of, um, he was had the most easygoing naturalness about him. And I think he was natural in interviews. He was natural in film. He was natural on stage. And I just happened to see a Ricky Gervais. It was called Extras. And he had Bowie on as a guest star. And it was just so wonderful to see that beautiful face again. But he was so natural. I mean, mm -hmm. There was no acting involved with him. Uh, there was no, he was just, he just was. There was a, a strong sense of being. And there was almost like, I know this is going to sound very spiritual, and I, um, but there was like a bright light coming from him. He didn't need all those Legos on stage. He had his own yeah. light. And uh, he was so kind and so generous. And uh, yeah, in fact, he asked me during uh, the rehearsal, the rehearsing part of it. We rehearsed in New York. Then we rehearsed in San Francisco. And then we toured. The National, we went to the Blackstone Theater in Chicago and, and further on. And he said, there's a reason I'm not getting a response with the handshake because John Merrick, you know, shakes uh, the hand of Mrs. Kendall. Well, his, he didn't have a hand. It was more like a club, the, the neurofibromatosis. So, and he was almost, he was so compromised physically. And boy, it was just, I worked with five elephant men. Five of them, Matthew. And I can honestly say the most profound, uh, um, prof most profound performance, I really believe, was so internalized by Bowie. He became John Merrick. But when I asked, when he asked me, why is this not working? I said, well, and I was wondering, what in the world is David Bowie asking me? For I mean, this guy doesn't know the stage, but this was really his very first professional theater gig was The Elephant Man, which I had no idea of, you know, because I'd seen him on so many stages, but on a theatrical stage, this was his first, his first experience, experience with it. And so I said, well, I think, David, I said, if you, um, how kind of you to ask, because it was all about the production, not about David Bowie, all about the production and making it uh, true to the audience, making it true to the playwright, making it real for the actors on stage and himself. And so I said, if you just raise your arm, you know, a half an inch, just maybe an inch, I think that might do it. And so afterwards he said, okay, love that. That was absolutely the right direction. I got, okay, love, thanks so much, love. And I thought, God, love, love, love. And he was a gentleman. I got roses, red roses on opening night in, in Denver. I got uh, yellow roses opening night in Chicago. He was a gentleman and um, so kind. When he left the theater, now you can only imagine the crowds, Matthew. Oh, yeah. And those, uh, you know, they put those borders up on either side going from, well, from the Blackstone Theater um, stage door all the way to the street at the Blackstone Theater in Chicago. So he had a, a heck of a long way to go because that alleyway was quite long. And it, the barricades on either side were fans. And you know that Bowie took the time after an unbelievably exhausting performance because his body was so contorted um, <clears throat> And if it was two shows, didn't make any difference. He still went out and he still signed all those autographs. He would go to the left, 
barricade, the right barricade, the left barricade, the right. He would go right and left all the way down that alleyway at the Blackstone Theater in Chicago, Illinois, in 1980, and he signed every one of those fans' playbills. Wow. I mean, I, 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 was, I was amazed by and so grateful that he was so human because if I had, it would have been so much harder for me to work with him, Matthew, if he had been this, if he had been David Bowie, but he was a guy that you could just sit down and have a beer with. Yeah. I love that. It made everybody so comfortable with him. That's, that's so wonderful to hear. Cause I mean, yeah, I, I feel like he's just such an amazing artist in so many ways. Oh, um, and really, so his final album, this final album was such a gift to us. Like he, he didn't need to make it, but he okay. still had something to say. And it was like his final present to all of us out there. Uh, I'm so happy to hear he's such a great guy. Oh, he was a great guy. Sweet man, gentleman. You couldn't say enough positive things about David Bowie. Um, I was saddened here because he was, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, he was 32 in 1980 when I worked with him in The Elephant Man. And I was 33, you know. And um, he just always treated me like a leading lady. And the, this, I mean, I was an unknown, Matthew. He was the star, but he treated me as if I were the star. And with such respect, I mean... There, there's not enough things you could say. He was a sweet man, and when he passed, I was. It was a uh, um, broke my heart, hmm. broke my heart, and I think it broke everybody's heart. But he was, he was so, he was a poet as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you look at the way he wrote his music and and the way that he and he was an avid reader. I said, David, do you read? He said, Oh yeah. I said, but he said, I'm always in two books at one time. He said, I never read just one book. I'm always reading two books. And I said, well, how do you, you know, sleep? Uh, it, it, how do you get to sleep after being contorted? Or do you get um, massages? He said he slept on a futon. He thought that was the best thing for the back. But oh. he was so, that's what I mean, Matthew. It was like talking to you, talking to Bowie, same thing. Wow. A, a relaxed, comfortable thing. And somebody who really had a great love of life and then the greatest love of his life Iman. Yes. And I was so happy he had a child with her. That was beautiful. That was a beautiful relationship. For anybody out there who's not entirely familiar as well with The Elephant Man, the, the Broadway production, you know, it's it's quite different from the, the David Lynch film. And I recommend you check out the clips out there of it because you know, you'll get an even more of an appreciation for who he was underneath, you know, all the stardom all underneath all of that because it is such a physically demanding role also. Not that he's wearing oh. the makeup, but the way he's performing, like you mentioned, with, you know, he has to crinkle up his limbs and do all these things with his mouth and the way he's speaking. And it's such a emotionally as well as physically demanding role. And, and to hear oh, that wow. he was still so humble enough to go out there and sign everybody's autographs, that's just beautiful to hear. Yes, that's, and it's the truth because I, he did it every night. Wow. He, we played Chicago for four, a month, four solid weeks. And wow. he did it every night. Did it at the Denver Auditorium. Did it in San Francisco. I mean, his fans were um, his friends, you know. And and then we had one horrific experience. We were on stage in Chicago, and it was a matinee, if I remember correctly. And um, all of a sudden, we hear this rumbling and tussling and whatever. And someone had gotten into the theater, and it was a packed house because he filled all those home houses that we had. And um, a man, a fan, some crazed human being, whoever he was, um, had a knife and was running down, running down the aisle. I was on stage left, Bowie was center stage. And Treves, which was Kevin Conway, was a great, I loved Kevin Conway. Uh, the dearly departed Kevin Conway is no longer with us, but he was... Uh, in the national tour with me and also Ken Ruta from San Francisco playing Dr. Treves. And so this madman runs down the aisle with a knife. And thank God all of these uh, wonderful ushers in every theater in the world, what would we do about ushers? They're our little guardian angels. They just tackled this guy. And there was a knife. He was coming at us. Uh, and then we never heard anything more of it. He just, I think he went to jail and hopefully he stayed there, but he was so, you know, one of these crazies. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And Bowie, 
never broke character. That's what I thought was really, talk about a genius, talk about being in the moment, talk yeah. about unbelievable concentration as well, Matthew. The moment he hit that stage, everything else went away. And then you became, you went into the world of the elephant man. Hmm. Because I think the, the star of a show, of any show, even the star of a television sh a series, dictates the energy and the mood that the other actors are going to feel and go into that make-believe world. And if they're comfortable working with the star, because the star has an enormous amount of power, then everything clicks, everything works. Everything is like a wonderful rainbow. Every single performance, you see a rainbow. And you're there for two or three hours, but the star dictates it. And then all of the satellites around that star feel embraced. And Bowie embraced everyone with lots of love. He's a great mm -hmm. guy. And, you know, to kind of bring this conversation full circle, because this is uh, allegedly a Star Trek podcast, uh, I don't know if you're aware, Conchetta, uh, Kevin Conway was actually in Deep Space Nine. Oh, that's right. I forgot, Matthew. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, I love Kevin Conway, I had to have him sign my poster when I saw him in New York. Um, he said, oh, my God, you still have the poster? This was like years later because he was he was a lovely, he loved animals, the rescue and whatever. So he was um, part of Best Friends Animal Sanctuary, Best Friends, um, uh, which is a rescue organization in Utah. And there would be... And I know the founders, Silva and Francis Batista, and Conway would always go to these dog walks to raise money for Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. And I would too, and I lived in New York. So um, when I knew he was going to go to this dog walk, I still had my Elephant Man poster. And he hadn't signed it because I, um, he left. Uh, I left for the national tour with Bowie, and he stayed on Broadway. And then I did it with Ken Ruta, uh, a wonderful actor as well. So I brought my Elephant Man poster to this dog walk uh, in New York City by the Hudson on one summer day. And he said, oh, my God, I can't believe you still have this. I won't say it, but you know his, his language poster. Um, I loved Conway. He was a consummate, consummate disciplinarian actor. Mm. Consummate. Wonderful man, too. Great good heart. And I love the fact that he loved rescue and animals as much as I did. It's kind of funny when I was looking through your resume and just like seeing the names you've worked with, so many oh. of the folks you perform with have crossed over into Star Trek, which is just, it makes my job so much easier. But, Isn't uh, that, yeah, and Kate Mulgrew, too. I course, mean, yeah. yes. She was my maid of honor, Matthew, if you want to really know some. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, I did not know that. It's some sweet dirt. Yeah, she was my maid of honor uh, at my wedding, and it was at her home in Brentwood when I married Norman, uh, 94, in, in June, June 18th. Uh, and... Um, yeah, known Kate many, 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 many years, and she was just spectacular as Captain Janeway. And then all of a sudden, I come on as this alien, and I looked like an alien, that's for darn sure. Um, and there was Kate looking beautiful with all this makeup and this wonderful, you know, <laughs> her star, her Voyager outfit and her, you know, that pin that they had. And, and I looked like death-eating crackers, Matthew. <laughs> Oh well, yeah, you might say that. I, I, we'll talk more about that coming up. But I, I actually thought you was quite wonderful as a dinosaur. So uh, you, <laughs> you showing through the makeup—that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. It was impossible. Um, it, I didn't really know how I was going to approach it, but it was such a great role and so beautifully written. Yeah, and wonderfully written. And um, there again, it was to me a Shakespearean role. So I used my background in stage and made it bigger than I normally would have. Yeah. Because everything in, is, is smaller in television and uh, less is more and all of those things that you hear about acting. I know nothing about acting, to be perfectly honest. I just go with the gut and go by instinct. So um, I, was, I was honored to be on that show, very, very honored to be on it, but knew really nothing about the Voth culture. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm glad you brought the Shakespearean thing because so many actors who come on my podcast, they say how it's so similar to Shakespeare because it's very really? dense dialogue. It's the rhythm of it, the cadence oh. of it, it's a lot of similarities. And this is beautiful segue. It's like you read my mind because I wanted to talk to you about oh, uh, Richard III because we're talking about wonderful people you've worked with. And you've worked with Kevin Klein twice on the stage. 
yeah. first in Shakespeare and in, in Richard III, and then later you guys worked together in Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, so I would just love to hear any Kevin Klein stories you have. <laughs> Let's get some more dirt going here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Klein is a universe unto himself. You know, I mean, he's... That's such a political way to say that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it was... I loved working with Kevin because um, he, too, he, too, was a generous, generous actor. And, you know, when you're on stage with Klein and all the stuff that he had done as well, but he was so funny. He was He's a naturally funny guy, naturally funny man. And, you know, his comedy in A Fish Called Wanda which, you know, he certainly deserved that award and many more after um, uh, he, I believe he should have received. But anyway, um, Kevin Klein, um, all you can, I mean, he would, he, he was, when it came to, he wanted to get all of his lines out of the way. So he would then be comfortable on stage with being in the moment and uh, making it all work with his, I mean, and you can only imagine Richard III, and you can only imagine Cyrano de Bergerac. These plays ran three hours long. We started uh, in the park with Richard III at um, 7.30. 7.30 we started earlier, and it came down at 11.30. It was a four-hour production. Um, and Klein, of course, was there with his swords, the swashbuckler of them all. And um, so one night it started to rain. Of course, it would be the time that my relatives came, the Bertelli family, from Wisconsin to see me. And it was, well, the audience started filing out and it was started to rain because we were on mics. So, of course, I was in the middle of the stage and just... Thanks for coming, everyone. And then the Wisconsin girl came out. The Midwest girl came out to me. You know, I could talk to a wall. I could talk to a rock. Um, I've never met a stranger, all that. And I thank you so much for coming and then drop, completely drop character. And it's the rain is coming down and Kevin Klein comes out on stage and he carries a black umbrella and he comes and he said, you know, he tried to... <laughs> excuse my behavior because I broke character and he pulled me back grabbed me by the arm and put me as I'm kissing everybody away okay backstage I thought he was going to say what were you thinking but he said I said oh Kevin I feel horrible my relatives my cousins and my little cousins are all here and he said well why don't we do it just change clothes let's see if the rain stops and let's just go um, in our regular clothes, get out of costume, and we'll do Act 4, Scene 4 for them. I mean, talk about generosity. Yeah. My family were blown away. They got a private audience performance with Kevin Klein and myself doing Act 4, Scene 4, which is the stick of Mythia, back and forth in 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 um richard the third and it's the only scene of all of shakespeare hopefully i'm accurate on this but of all the shakespearean plays it's the only the only scene that goes about 20 minutes long between a man and a woman in which a woman fights back she fights back she fights she goes up against richard the third and a whole army that's coming behind him and we did that scene, and by the group, and I was lucky and and very honored and very grateful still to have won the Bayfield um, Award, which is an award given in New York for an actor, a supporting actor in a Shakespearean play. So the next day, he finds out <laughs> that I I won the award. So he calls me up and to congratulate me, and he says, "So I hear you won the award." He said, well, "How come you won the award?" I'm the king, and <laughs> I burst out laughing, and I thought, that is Kevin Klein. That's what makes him so quite wonderful. He's just so much fun. He's like a, a clown car, but with the smartest, smartest, brightest comebacks in, in, in his humor. Very, very smart and quick and, uh, and so lithe on his feet, my God. 
Um, we're not that many. I think I'm also two years older than Kevin Klein, but a lot of great stories. And Kevin loved his actors. You know, uh, he loved working with his actors. And uh, he'd had a coach that would go and um, do lines with him at night uh, after the rehearsal. I mean, he was a consummate, <laughs> disciplined performer, disciplined. Mm -hmm. But it all came naturally as well. And you, you could, the love that he had being on stage, the great love of the theater, it translated also into film that it was just so much fun to be with him because he made it so much fun. It wasn't work with Kevin. He knew how to work and he worked well and he was very disciplined about um, learning his lines and getting things a bit or whatever it is he was doing to work. And he'll, he'd work. It wouldn't make any difference if the character had three lines. If you wanted to make that, that moment work for both of those actors, he did. And um, and then at the very closing performance, I happened to wink at him. This is something I should not have done. It was the last performance of Siren Hunter Bershrak. And I come in and I, as the duena, as Jennifer Garner's nanny, the duena, and um, Jennifer was also a, an extraordinary human being uh, playing Roxanne. And so I come in, It's I thought, well, it's closing night. I normally don't screw around like that, but I thought I won't do anything that to throw him off. And so I curtsied and then I went, I winked. <laughs> and in true Klein fashion, he went, he responded. He acted at that moment, even though he had no, I mean, he didn't expect me to wink at him. I thought, what the hell is she doing? And he just went, reacted. It was so funny, and I thought, what fun. And I knew I could do it because Kevin and I were friends, and it was the last performance, and it wasn't going to throw off a monologue or anything, but I just wanted to see what he'd do if I winked at him. And I winked. I made sure I winked upstage, not downstage, Matthew. So the eye was, and he went, what a strange thing to do. I completely <laughs> reacted in the moment for that unexpected moment. Can't say enough nice things about Klein either. I I have been, as you said earlier, worked with so many, many wonderful, great pros, actors, but good human beings. You know, I that's what made it so much fun, Matthew. If you worked with somebody that was all ego and not a healthy ego, um, it wasn't fun. And um, I always loved what I did. I still do. And hopefully I will do more of it because it was fun and you have to make it fun. Then why do it? You might as well. Very true. You know, you might as well do something else mm -hmm. that you love. Really yeah, you important know. to do what you love. Yes. Good life lesson there. Uh, you know, one, one of the interesting things that you've been talking about with your performing is how you said it's for you instinctual, but you know, yeah. a lot of the roles we've talked about so far and that we'll talk about as well throughout this episode here today is, you know, for example, Richard III, that is Shakespearean. That is a fairly traditional role. And you would think there's not much room for instinct, which I would interpret instinct meaning uh, being more responsive to who you're performing with and responsive and reacting more so than being stuck within the pages of the word. So right. you know, we're talking about shows like The Elephant Man. We're talking about Richard III, Cyrano de Bergerac. Uh, even your Star Trek role, we could say as well later on, you know, it is a pretty regimented sort of role. It's very structured. Right. So for you as a performer who likes to go on instinct, uh, can you kind of describe, I guess, first off, what instinctual acting means to you and uh, how you use that for these classical, more traditional roles? Well, first of all, you are, you are cloaked in this wonderful invisibility cloak like Harry Potter. Nobody can see it, but you know it's around you. And it's a safe cloak. It's a really safe space for you, the invisibility cloak. There's no other way I can other than Harry Potter. Um, and I think an actor has to feel safe in their own space, not only the stage space, but the space that they take on stage. So I always felt safe with the dialogue. I always felt safe, especially if it was well-written, like 
Shakespeare. Can't get any better written than that. And so I felt safe in that space. So within that warm invisibility cloak of security, I could play. I could play within that safe space. Hmm. Now, when I mean play, I could really intuit, go into uh, what I felt first, and hopefully it was what the words um, were about to say. If it wasn't in sync, then I would just intuitively, gut, get rid of it. doesn't work. It isn't speaking to me. It has to speak to me. The in, in The instinct for any actor is something that's really hard to explain, Matthew. But it's, um, you just feel it, you know it, and you know if it's right, and you know if it's just in, it's so in the wrong direction. You know, you're going, instead of entering, you're exiting, and you just know you're, you're being led in the wrong direction. But w within the framework of Shakespeare, especially, Within the framework of Shakespeare, because Shakespeare, there was a lot of playing around, you know, the joke, the jokes and the clown and the, and the joker and the tricksters, all of those characters, you could just try to make them real. Mm -hmm. Try not to make it Shakespearean, but try to make it real within that safe cloak that surrounded you in the space of that stage and in that and in that character you have to know the character so well and the only way you know a character well is to live with it on and off stage you know is to read the script over and over and over again be in those rehearsals really be in the rehearsals turn off your phone just turn off those phones and stay with the script stay with the written word and don't try to um try to well, try to just be real. The whole, that, that's all I can say is just to be as honest as you can with the dialogue. Because the iambic pentameter, you know, you have that structure. You can't veer away from that. Shakespeare gives you that. And that are, those are guidelines. And they're, they're wonderful, wonderful guidelines. It's just like, but then you take, when you, when you're flying with the iambic pentameter and you are in the moment and in the scene, then all those stop signs and those red lights, you could toss those away and you play within the parameters. And I think that's what, um, and then it would be safe to use your instinct. But you just know instinctually if something's wrong for that character. If you feel you know the character well enough because you've been cast in that character, they think, the casting people think you know it, so you better, well, you, hopefully you'll know it um, if they cast you because you, you don't want to disappoint anyone. But most of all, I never wanted to disappoint myself. I had to be true to myself and true to the script, always true to the script, whatever it was, whether it was shake, um, Chekhov or whether it was Shakespeare or whether it was Tennessee Williams or whether it was, you know, China Beach. John Young, dearly departed John Sacred Young, our uh, co-creator of China Beach, passed away two years ago, another sad, sad loss. Um, you, you know, they gave you everything. You just had to fly with it. But then you couldn't go beyond those parameters. You had to stay within that framework. That's how I, that's how I try to work, unless it's really crazy sitcom you know it's it's rom-com sitcom it's different but if you're playing queen elizabeth which i was there were parameters that i had to follow and then i could bring in whatever i wanted but if it didn't feel right then toss it hmm. toss it out and then of course if the director is watching you work and you think it's just it's just the best choice you've ever made mm -hmm. and they say not working not working, Gonzetta, then you toss it. Because an actor is like a kid who plays in a, in a sandbox. He doesn't want to throw his sand uh, at any of the other kids in that sandbox. He wants to share that sandbox and all of the toys, the 
the pails and the shovels and everything else. He wants to share that because the stage is a big sandbox that we play in. Actors play in. It's the most wonderful. It's the safest place to be on stage for me. Yeah. It's like a sandbox and we're all playing and, and hopefully not throwing sand in everybody else's <laughs> eyes, but playing with them. Never, never playing alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love your insight on this because like, so even just from the whole invisibility cloak, I kind of can tell exactly what you meant by it. And uh, that's a wonderful description, wonderful way to put that. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions. Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, TFP creates 3D-printed Star Trek and sci-fi-inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, a Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Mego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the U.S., with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. TFP also has a pay what you want section, where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using Untold 10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Hey, I'm Licia Nav, a.k.a. Ensign Sonia Gomez from Star Trek TNG. And now Captain Sonia Gomez on Lower Decks with her own ship, the Archimedes. Yay! I finally got a promotion after 25 years. So anyway, I'm here to talk about drivebydogooders.org. It's a little charity I run where we go to the outskirts of Skid Row and from our car windows, we hand out basic human essentials like water, wipes, cold stream cheese, socks, tarps, masks, t-shirts, things to keep people warm. So we just think that everyone deserves clean water, some protein, and a way to clean themselves, especially during Corona. We also hand out masks to those who really, really need it, who live in tents on the street, mainly the disabled and elderly who have a really hard time getting to services. We do all of this with no agenda, just pure giving, no overhead. If you'd like to go to the website and donate, it's 100% 100% tax deductible. And if you click on the donate button, you can go right to the $35 option and pick a signed autographed picture of either the Star Trek The Next Generation or Lord X or Total Recall, where I played the three breasted mutant hooker on Mars. And uh, that's the X rated version. Put in the comments section your address and anything you'd like me to write, and I'll personally inscribe it and mail it off to you immediately. And again, that's drivebydogooders.org. Ensign, I mean, Captain. Sonia Gomez, signing off. I do want to talk about one other sci-fi show before we eventually get into our Star Trek stuff here. And that's because, sure. you know, uh, serendipitously, I started watching this TV series recently because I found it online. I never saw it before. Uh, so I started watching Max Headroom. And you oh. were actually in Max Headroom. And you were there performing with William, uh, William Morgan Shepard. Uh, you were uh, blank Dominique. William was blank Reg. And you yeah. worked with another wonderful Star Trek alumni and a guy I, I want to have on this show so bad, uh, Matt Frewer. I love him. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'd love to hear any stories you remember of working with Matt in particular, but just from being on that show, because what a what a different kind of show. This is a show that would do so well in today's times. Yep. And the, and they canceled it because at that at that time, nobody got it. I mean, you yeah. couldn't go and get a beer and come back and pick up where you left off. It was so um, involved. It's you know? such an unheard of show. I mean, it's a dystopian cyberpunk show. Like, you, don't, you don't get that in that era. I I. Now, that was the very first professional job I did um, in television in Los Angeles. Max Headroom was before China Beach. And, um, oh, my God, what an unbelievable experience that was. And uh, and my dearly departed sweetheart, Charlie Rocket. What a wonderful, wonderful actor Charlie Rocket was. 
and um, Amanda Pays and Jeffrey Tambor and my beloved, another one, my dearly departed beloved Morgan Shepherd. Oh gosh, so many. You know, if if you're lucky enough to one be in the business or and and I never think I made it. You know, just I've just been grateful to have been able to take the journey. And uh, some people thought it was right for a number of roles, and I was just so grateful, knock on wood, to be able to follow that dream. That's why I owe everything to my mother and father. Had they said, no, stay teaching, uh, because that's what the family does, don't follow your dream, I would have, because I respect it. You come from an uh, Italian background, culture, old world, you know. I didn't know that you were Sicilian. That's wild. Had no way of knowing that. Um, I wouldn't have followed that dream. I would have honored them, and then I would have continued teaching, and always would have doubted. You know, I wonder what would have happened if would have, could have, should have, didn't. But with Max Headroom, that was the most unbelievable experience for a very first television experience because. It was so involved, so complex. You know, they had to get the fog in to make it look like it was, you know, a, a otherworldly. And then every we, single scene is like a shot out of Blade Runner, practically. Yes, yes, and and photographically, they did a beautiful job. I mean, it was the production values were were beautiful, and of course, Morgan Shepherd had done it in London. He was the in the, the original you know, uh, Max Hedrum. So all of the American actors working around him were, you know, um, were hired to, to do it, but he had done it in London and he, another unbelievable, generous actor. Oh my God. And so much fun. He was blank Reg. He was really blank Reg. And, and, and such a un unbelievable voice. I mean, have you ever heard a better voice? I mean, a really a great, great voice. And also very um, uh, specific, very specific in the way that he worked. And there, there is a specificity that the, the, the British actors have. Yeah. That, and there, we're, we're different and very much alike in that I think the Brits and the Americans love what they do if they're really if they love what they do they're great at doing it i mean you can't compare the british and the uh, american because i mean there's we've got great actors on both sides of sides of the ocean but um max headroom there were so many different locations there was downtown los angeles and i would be climbing ladders to get up onto the bus for that, that pink bus was, was our underground radio station. Yeah. And then there was, oh my God, we were just hours and hours and then in the studio and then making everything look so authentic. But then, you know, everything I've ever done, and I think of it, China Beach, Providence, uh, Max Headroom, the authenticity was really, really important with, for the producers and the director. And which helped us create the world around us. The Max Headroom's world was a real, it was a kick. It was a strange world, but it was really a hard, um, hard first job. And that it was so alien to me, you know, I mean, that whole, and it would have been perfect now. You know, there's going to be, I understand, there's going to be a remake of Max Headroom. Yeah. Supposed to be a remake, and I believe they got Matt Frewer for it as well, which will be interesting to they see. They got Matt. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, he was he was so sweet. He was so sweet, and he had his own um, his own lovely sense of humor. But just a very low key kind of guy, easy, very easy to work with, and um, and fun. There was also that little twinkle, you know, that he had in his eye. Always had that little twinkle. And Charlie Rocket was loved. Charlie Rocket. I mean, I, I don't think there's any actor I've ever worked with that I didn't like and didn't learn from. <laughs> really. And I've been very lucky to have learned and liked a lot of them, worked with a lot of them. Well, and we mentioned it a few times in this interview already. I think now it's about time we get to this one here. Uh, I can't not talk to you about China Beach. And uh, you know, this is a show <laughs> that you yeah. started for four years. Unfortunately, I was a little bit too itty-bitty to know about the show. 
But uh, little I've been able to find of it on YouTube. It, it seems like a show I, I'd really like to watch, actually. Uh, and folks well, who don't you know they have a box set. Matthew. They do. Yeah, it's on DVD. I was trying to watch it for you know prepare for this interview, and I was able to only find like a few clips on YouTube. Uh, oh. I, I don't. I don't think Conchetta, I'd be able to watch a full four seasons before doing this chat with you. But <laughs> I tried. I did try. <laughs> Um, that's true but that's you know true. the thing is too i mean this show not only uh you're working with some like real wonderful people like dana delaney and michael boatman but we've got wow. real star trek alumni here we got robert picardo and jeff cover um yeah. and so i i know i it's so hard for me to pinpoint what i want to even ask you about this show because it's a whole four-year experience that you went through but uh, i guess let's just start with robert picardo and jeff cover uh what can you tell me about working with them in that time period uh well the, these guys were a lot of fun I mean, a lot of fun. Picardo, especially. Picardo is a naturally funny human being. And can I just uh, tell you, Conchetta, too, how weird it is seeing him with hair? Because I'm used to only seeing him as the hologram of Voyager. <laughs> him with a full head of hair is just like the most upsetting thing to me ever. <laughs> I know. And Picardo, very, very bright, too. Very, very smart actor. Very quick wit. Very quick wit. And, um, you know, all those guys, uh, Cobra. And Picardo and Boatman, I mean, they all really, truly loved each other. I mean, th this was a family on China Beach, a family. Uh, working with Bob was always a lot of fun. Cobra, I didn't work that much with Cobra. You know, being Dodger, he had a more, uh, and talk about concentration, almost like the concentration of, uh, that you would equivalent uh, equate with Spencer Tracy being on a stage. Because mm -hmm. um, Cobra, that, that character was so focused. And, you know, when he smiled, it was so, when he did smile, when he chose those smiles, and they were very far and few in between, which was perfect for Dodger because he was in so much emotional pain, having, you know, uh, been in a country, really up close and personal with everybody fighting and dying. Uh, there was, you know, Jeff was just, um, there was a, 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 a sweetness about Dodger, a sweetness about Jeff Cobra that you would never have known with the character of Dodger. It was just like night and day, night and day. Uh, because in, in real life, Jeff is a real, is a sweetheart. Uh, and he teaches meditation. He knows how to meditate. You know, you would never ever think this about Dodger or Jeff Cobra, but he does. And deep as an ocean, you know, and Picardo was always the funny guy. Very, very funny. Just quick witted and, and, um, uh, also generous and just so fast with his comic timing. So fast with his comic timing. And then he could switch it and it was just, um, the drama of being at war. Just switch it like that. But then Picardo came from the stage yeah. as well. True. Um, Boatman, his, Boatman's daughter, the second daughter, Mackenzie, is Jordan, who's an actress. Uh, Mackenzie, second daughter, she graduated summa cum laude from USC, my husband's uh, law school. Uh, and uh, she's my goddaughter, Mackenzie. And then he has two others, Aiden and Jacob is the only son. They're both at Howard University. Um, but Boatman is like family, was like family. And those, you know, everyone was unknown. At that time, in 1987, when we did China Beach, these were all unknown actors. I mean, I had worked on stage in New York, and Picardo had worked on stage with Jack Lemmon uh, in New York, but I didn't know anybody else. And I know Dana um, had a lot of uh, New York connections and work, but we were really all unknowns. I mean, China Beach put our names out there. And, you know, it was such an honor to be on that show because of obviously um, what it was trying to say or trying to share with those vets that were here, the vets that were didn't live to see it. And those writers were so adamant about being accurate, to have it be a positive and accurate portrayal of nurses 
and also uh, in Vietnam and the war and the stories. So we told their stories, but we told stories of vets that would come in and speak with John Young or Bill Broyles or Lydia Woodward or Carol Flint or any of our, or Joseph Anderson, or any of the, those wonderful writers that we had. Uh, so it was a positive and accurate portrayal that John Young wanted, wanted to um, throw out into the universe. And he threw it out brilliantly. And Bill Broyles, his partner, Bill Broyles, the other co-creative of he was an infantry lieutenant at age 17 <laughs> in Vietnam. So talk about a long day of filming. I mean, after some people, literally, uh, it was a um, tour of duty. We were on location in um, Indian Dunes, China Beach, and then tour of duty was a little further. And, you know, some of these crew guys would go home at four in the morning. I mean, I worked a 24 hour day one night. I worked, uh, Dana always worked an 18 hour day, never less than 18 hours or Picardo or Cobra or Brian Wimmer, who did wonderful when that episode when he lost his legs and, uh, an unbelievable episode with Wimmer in it. Um, they were killed. Some of these crew members were killed in car accidents driving home because it was so early in the morning. We had gone so many hours that I think they have now, the union has said that you cannot work more than 12 or 14 hours. I mean, we were working 18, 24 hours. Just keep, we just went on going all night. It's, I don't, I don't know how we did it. Well, we were younger, but still, but we loved what we did. I mean, you could do anything if you love what you do. Anything. Love is just the main ingredient to um, working in the arts, whether it's acting or it's painting or it's making music, poetry. It's like meditation because you just, you zen to a place that's very special, but then it's not only about you, it's about sharing the gift. It's about sharing the gift that you love with everybody else and hopefully they'll love it too because it's always not sharing you it's sharing your gifts there's a difference yeah it's interesting uh that you mentioned Conchetta how there were a lot of like actual people from the Vietnam War involved in the show as well uh and that's I feel like that's what made the show so unique you know like for me uh I think I'm from a different generation I didn't really grow up watching MASH I'd catch reruns of it wasn't super into it um but then I've seen like you know the little clips I've seen with China Beach and I'm like this is a show I can get into and I think a part of that is really the authenticity. So you know, I'd love to hear you kind of touch on that, the authenticity of having actual people who were in the Vietnam War as part of this production. Well, that brings to mind my uh, my sweetheart on the show, uh, Troy Evans, who played Bub Pepper. You know, and uh, he was a Vietnam veteran. He served uh, a year and a half tour of duty, and the most unbelievable experiences that you can't even imagine. You couldn't make it up. It was so raw. And when there was uh, episodes about that, and then they brought back all of the, um, when I think about doctors, nurses that served in Vietnam, there was a show, a memory, you know, uh, to honor these people. And these people were on camera and told of their experiences. Well, one of those experiences was Troy Evans. What, what the show that we had uh, was Troy Evans' um, memory of it, and it actually happened to him uh, uh, in Vietnam. And John Yun Young used uh, that story in one of the episodes in which he lost, you know, this practically an entire platoon of men trying to save one man on a hill and his dog, his German shepherd dog. And that just, but all of these things, you know, they weren't just stories, they were real and people experienced them. So we were telling, we weren't telling our stories. We were telling everyone else's, those stories. We were telling their stories, the Vietnam veteran stories. So, but Troy Evans was, oh my God, make you cry make you cry and look at um, when we went to the wall. That's where we filmed the last episode of China Beach at the wall. 
And um, I remember I had two high school friends that lost their lives there, David Leet and Raleigh Hewitt. And that was in 19, well, later on uh, in the 60s, certainly. But when we were in standing from the wall, Troy and I had, then we subsequently got married, you know, um, as the years progressed. And he was standing there and looking at the names of these men and women that gave their lives and just, I mean, tears. And, you know, John Young, they were filming it. We filmed in DC and get up at three in the morning for hair and makeup because we had to get out of that park area because that was open to the public before nine o'clock in the morning. So we would film from three to nine. <laughs> and it was an unbelievable schedule. But And Troy was so, always so moved there and one of the most sensitive human beings. And I think that sensitivity that comes from life, whether uh, certainly if you've been in war and in combat and have held people in your arms and watched them die, even if you aren't in combat, you still did it. I held my dad in my arms uh, before he passed away. It's an honor to do that. And it either destroys you or it makes you stronger to continue to go on. And um, I think what Troy Evans went through as a human being to get to where he is today was quite a journey. It's quite a journey. I always wanted Troy to write his own, to write his story in the book. And he's constantly giving back at the veterans. He goes to the veterans um, the VA here and he speaks and he's very, very much supportive, you know, as is Gary Sinise, you know, the wounded warriors. And, um, you know, you have to just respect those guys that give back. They just give back. And, of course, it was Chloe Webb and Mark Helgenberger and Dana Delaney and Megan Gallagher and all of those quite, you know, Nancy Giles, all those wonderful women and, and men that we all came together and it became a family. China Beach did become a family. And John Young treated us all as his kids. He really did. And he wasn't older than we were. He was our age, really. He was my age. But I just went to his memorial this last um, May at the um, Skirball Center, and it was very moving. Ricardo was there, Cobra was there, Chloe Webb, uh, Megan, myself, Mark Helgenberger. Boatman had to fly back. Um, I had just had his daughter's graduation party at my home. And so he flew back, and little did he know he had COVID, so he didn't go. He wasn't able to go to that memorial, which I was. I really wanted Boatman to go, but he was going to go back for the good fight, and he ended up not working anywhere because he got the COVID. But I'm so glad you let me talk about um, Troy Evans because his stories were, they used his stories. They were real. You know, I feel like, you know, very much acting is essentially the imitation of life, the imitation and observation of life. But when you have these authentic experiences, it really brings a whole new layer to what you're doing, what you're performing Absolutely. and what you're presenting to the viewer. Yes, it really does bring a whole new layer. You know, it's it's like having, almost like having open heart surgery, you know, on an emotional level, you know, um, and then getting to the other side of it. I mean, there's so many vets that, have not gotten to the other side of it, you know, and um, the PTSD, all of the aftermath of war, even what's happening now in, in the Ukraine. I mean, talk about human resilience. The resilience of the human body is astonishing to me. It's astonishing. It's the spirit. It's the will that just keeps you going. As Kobe Bryant said, another sweet man I never met, but he just seemed like a lovely human being. And he said, you know, you just can't get bogged down. You know, you can't look back to the past. You can only move forward. Don't get bogged down with the negatives. Just continue to move forward. And I think that sort of says it all. And just unrelated to everything, I just love the descriptive way you talk about things, from Kevin Klein being a clown car to this type of performing the open heart surgery. I just love the way you talk about things. <laughs> Thank you. Matthew, what a nice compliment. 
Thank you for that. Just well, very visual. Already... It's really great. You know, it's oh, you know, and that's okay. what you do. You're a visual that's... person, so yeah, it's oh. uh, it really helps well. me understand what you're talking about. So thank you for that. You're welcome, Matthew, and thank you for that as well. That's very kind. But I, I think I love the poetry. I love always loved poetry and you know and literature, and that was you know mainly my major. And so I think in those. I think I think in those terms. I never thought of I until you just said it. But Thank you, anyway, for that. All right, well, uh, Conchetta, let's now beam into our Star Trek discussion here. Oh, uh, so, boy, okay. Yeah, this is a good, this is a really great episode, I have to admit to you. I haven't seen this one in a long time, and watching it again was a real treat. Uh, so you play Minister Odala, and this is the third season Voyager episode, Distant Origin. So uh, let's take this one from the top here. Uh, how did you get this role? Do you remember what the audition was like? Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, I do remember the audition was like, we were all lined up as we all are, um, poor actors, and um, waiting to go in, having your number called. Uh, so we were out, uh, we were at Paramount, that's where we filmed it, and, um, and the, you know, all these actors in chairs, and to be perfectly honest, I don't know who I was competing with, I don't remember that, but I do remember a whole slew of actors waiting to be called in and I um, I walked in and I did the monologue, one of the monologues, because that's what reminded me so much about the Shakespeare is because it's bigger than life. Um, these monologues, because you rarely have monologues when you wor work in television, it's just you know back and forth dialogue, kind of like kitchen table talk. But um, unless you're on a really great show that has great dialogue, so um, I walked in. And I, they, you know, they said, do you have any questions? Well, I had a million, but I wasn't about to ask them because <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to get out of here if I ask all of these questions about the ancient Saurian species and the Delta Quadrant and um, the distant origin theory. So I thought, I'm just going to do my work and walk out of the room. So I, um, I did my monologue. And um, I said, thank you. I turned around and I walked out. And that was it. It, that, it was like an out-of-body experience. But then I thought, well, playing an alien would be like an out-of-body experience. So um, that was it. It wasn't anything to write home about. Um, it's just that I was n nervous. You know, I think actors, and you have to use that those nerves endings you've got to use them in the best possible way so they don't capsize you and uh drown you into not getting a roll you know you got to rise above those waves so um yeah i auditioned and it was i don't think they they didn't it's this is off the record but it's going to be on the record I think it's they, they just associated me as being uh, a military, as being Lila Garo, you know, mm -hmm. the major Lila Garo on China Beach. And I don't think they, I had to really not work hard, but I had to really be Odala. And I, you know, you can't be Odala until you're in a rehearsal process and you're in the process of the director telling you what he does and does not want you to do or likes and or dislikes you with your actions. You can't work in a vacuum. But I had this feeling that they thought, oh, she's on a military show and uh, I don't think she's going to be able to pull this off. That was the feeling I got. That's the intuit. That's those gut feelings that you can't really explain. And I'm not explaining it very well now, but um, that's how I felt. So I thought, well, I'll just have to throw those thoughts away that they may have and give them Odala. And um, I guess I did. I think so it worked yeah. out, whatever you did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's kind of funny because you mentioned, you know, Lila being the hard edge major. Um, yeah. Odala is, is similar, but, it's, but she is pretty different because, you know, and I feel like this is a great example of who you are as a performer. Uh, Cause I feel like you as a person, you very much exude this like quiet inner strength and Odala is like that as well. Just, you know, volume up to 10 or something. So I feel like while they're the similar kind of character, they are different. And uh, maybe it's those experiences as Lila that you kind of brought into this that helped you portray this character in such yeah. a wonderful way. Hadn't thought that, but you're right. Yeah, hadn't thought that. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Because I think <laughs> you, you, all of those characters, you walk with them. Yeah. You know, once you've experienced them and they're your friends, and even if they're the, the <laughs> horrific characters, I remember talking to Colleen Dewhurst years ago, and she said to me, because I won the, um, uh, I won the Sarah Siddons Award at the Goodman School of Drama and as a student there, and Colleen Dewhurst won the Siddons Award, uh, Sarah Siddons, in Chicago. It's only given in Chicago. And, you know, she said, I'm never talking that evening. It was a big gala at the Ambassador East and West Hotel in Chicago. And I remember talking with her and she said, you know, what's really important is not to judge your characters. Mm, yeah. If you play a prostitute, uh, if you play a murderer, if you play, you know, a serial killer, if you play a prostitute, anything that you would judge yourself, don't judge it. Toss away all judgment and just get into them. But don't judge the character because the moment you judge it, you're not going to be able to create it. And I just thought, wow, that <laughs> I thought to myself, you know, all you need from a great actor or a great actress is just one line and it may, it, it turns everything around and all of a sudden you know what to do. And that's, a, that's a great. So, um, I had to, um, that, that's another thing when I, I thought, well, how in the world am I going to get my head around this alien, you know, but then I found out that they originated the Voths on earth. So yeah. they were, you know, humanoid. Um, and then they were in the, um, uh, I have my notes here. They were on earth in the alpha quadrant, but then they went to the delta quadrant and then they were very smart human beings, you yeah. know, but a smart species, but they were lizard, more serpentine and lizard like than anything. But, um, yeah, that audition, I had to really prove myself. I had to erase what I had done for with Lila and then create something new in that moment. Yeah, that was harder than I had thought it was. But you know, it's interesting just from you talking right now, you're talking about not judging the character that you're playing. You know, it's something I've, I've heard from a lot of guests in this show is they'll really? tell me you know, when they're playing a bad guy, you're not playing a bad guy. You're playing a good guy who, you know, thinks they're doing the right thing. They That's don't right. know they're a bad guy. So, That's you know, right. What's interesting That's with Odala right. is, um, you know, I, I feel like, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit in my own questions here, but I feel like with Odala, there's this great scene where you, you basically I think it is your monologue towards the mm -hmm. end. And mm -hmm. um, you know, you're kind of talking about distant origin theory and how it's all a sham and whatever. But right. it almost feels like at one point you turn away from uh, from from Gagan and from Captain Janeway, or sorry, from Gagan and from uh, Chakotay. You turn away from them, and you're almost like it's almost like a Shakespearean thing where you're talking to the audience, you know, like you're and you're almost hinting at that. You know what? Maybe Odala actually does believe what Gagan says, and maybe yeah. he doesn't want it to be this way. But because you have to follow tradition, that's what you have to do. So it's almost like. You know, you have your motivations, even if your heart is telling you something else. And that's such a really great, subtle piece of acting in there. It was. Oh, well, thank you. I I felt the need to go back to the universe. And that's what. Um, that's what uh, um, made me turn. Mm. Because I felt the safest place that I could be would be within the celestial, you know, um, world that I knew that was safe for me and that dictated that turn. But it was also, you know, it, it's just like yin and yang, yang, yin and yang. Um, I didn't know it would be dictating. I just felt that if I was back with the stars in there in that safe space, I'd be okay. Because she didn't really want to, um, you know, he backed down anyway. She yeah. just, she just felt that she was compromising uh, the, the the doctrine, and she was representing representing um, that Voth culture, and she was, you know, the minister that she had to protect those theories. Because there was, 
that they had, there was suggested evidence that they originated on Earth and thus the distant origin theory. She didn't want to nail Gagan, but he, and he had to back off. He had to back off. Chakotu tried to say, well, yes, but look at what you did accomplish. You know, if you weren't Earth and then you went into uh, the distant origin theory and you went into um, the Delta Quadrant, look what the Voths, what they accomplished. They were one of the highest uh, uh, in intelligence of their species. But she didn't see it that way. She just thought it would be, she was, she was going to stay the course. And, um, you know, and, and it's, <sighs> she was such a complex character on so many levels, Matthew. You know, I mean. She really um, was. I mean, watching again, I did not expect that. Like, when that scene happens, it's just like, it really changes your entire perspective on yeah. who Mr. Odal is. Yeah, because there was also part of her that had, um, she was so uh, divided. Yeah. Divided. She could see Gagan. She respected him as a scientist. And, um, but she also believed that she had to be true to that doctrine. She was ruled by that doctrine. But there were parts in the dialogue, and hopefully I showed uh, as the Odala, as the Voth female, um, some kind of humanity. You know, because she came, she, they came from Earth. No one, you know, they just thought, you know, I mean, no, no one, there was a huge amount of evidence that they came from Earth, right? So I thought, I can use that humanity, not necessarily thinking Voth, but you, use the, the Saurian uh, humanoid facet of it and not just the Voth alien. You know, I wanted to bring them both together. And if there isn't that kind of, like even with Lila in China Beach, Matthew, if she was going to be all discipline and all rules and regs, where was her humanity? Where was her sensitivity? Where, where was the woman in Lila? Yeah. That Bud Pepper was attracted to. He couldn't be attracted to all military. Where was the humanity in her? And I think that's what helped me to uh, live with and portray her as honestly uh, and as accurately as I could, Odala. Yeah. I like, I like to call it the story within the story, especially for yes. characters. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And there had to be, and I, and you would never think that she'd have a sensitivity. But there was that moment with Gagan that you thought she could go either way. Yeah. She just couldn't. She was pulled back. Hmm. Pulled back. Uh, and I, it's, it's also, it's like when you talk about religion, you know, uh, Catholicism, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. Um, Protestantism. You you are what you grow up, you know, to be. I mean, you if you have some great values, and I think I did coming from the Midwest. Um, and you sometimes you hold true to some some of those values. Very very, they're, they're strong values. You can't just toss them away once you've gotten to be an adult or whatever. Um, and those values are what dictates the rest of your life. It dictates your strength. It dictates your weaknesses. It dictates how you're going to treat people kindly or compassionately or not treat them that way. Everything starts in childhood. And um, so that is, I think you have to bring all of that experience, <clears throat> life experience, yeah. to the script, to the stage, you know, to every day that you live, even if you're standing in line in a bank and you're late and you're really irritated and this woman is just talking on and on like I am, droning about something, and <laughs> you have to be patient because your mom and dad taught you respect, 
hopefully taught you resilience to live in the world and just taught you to be kind. So all those things, that, that's what I, I hope. I hope everybody um, goes back to those values when they feel lost in space, but they're not, they're really on earth, but they're lost somewhere along the line. They lose themselves, where, whatever it is, but they go back to the basics. And I think that's what she knew she had to do. Aldala knew she had to respect the elders. She represented the elders. And she had to honor the elders, and she had to honor that doctrine. And I think it's no different than you honoring your mother and father and honoring the people that you grew up with, that you admired, and that uh, you learned from. Same thing. You just have to apply it in a different way. And Conchetta, you're not journaling at all. If you were, I'd be face first taking a nap right now on my desk here. So everything you're saying has been brilliant so far. I love uh, just hearing how serious you treat the character, how you treated the character, and just... Your whole take on it is wonderful. So, um, you know, and on this note too, since you brought up the some some religious elements here, uh, you know, that's something I noticed in this episode too. Was uh, whether or not you're aware of it, the episode was originally uh, inspired by Galileo and his trials by the Catholic Church in the 1600s. Uh, and you know, from a modern standpoint, I could even see this being a little bit, a little bit of like Inherit the Wind. Ah, uh, uh, my favorite yeah. play. Yeah, wonderful, Lee wonderful and movie. Lawrence. Too. Yeah, Jerome Lee Lawrence, my favorite play. I always wanted to play Daryl, but I know it was a man's role. And Spencer Tracy played it brilliantly in, in the film, but that's my favorite play in Here at the Wind. Funny you should say that. And I'm trying to remember who, uh, which character he was in the next, I haven't read it in so long, but like, I, feel, I feel like you were playing the, the equivalent of Spencer Tracy's character in this one. If oh, I remember. Daryl, Clarence Darrow, the Chicago uh, criminal. Uh, the Rainbow Tower. Suspenders. Uh. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, I'm wondering, you know, if you had any thoughts about that when you read the script here. I mean, did you have any strong feelings to the ideas here, or uh, what was your interpretation of this material? Because it's some pretty heavy stuff. Oh, it is very, very heavy stuff. Well, I mean, you had to go back and and find out uh, where she came from, or that whole species came from. You know, yeah. uh, very, very heavy stuff. And I thought the one thing that she that she loved, she she really loved and respected. I mean, she was so looked up to, and she had such a huge responsibility being an elder. I mean, she was Minister Odala, and she was the Ministry of Elders, and she had a huge responsibility, and she had to f- live up to that responsibility. And But part of her human nature with Gagan pulled her in one direction, and I saw her being pulled. It's like um, it's like a shooting star. There were so many shooting stars going off, and she had to maintain that centeredness. And she had to maintain that center, and the, and she had to be true to the doctrine and the authority granted to her by that doctrine. And that was not the easiest thing for her to do. You know, you think looking at her and then this big voice that just came out of me and, you know, because it was such a larger than life character. I really felt that I was doing a Shakespearean play and then they wrote it very um, formally, very from it wasn't the jester, that's for sure. Um, it was more like Iago. And um, <laughs> but then there was that part of me that thought, I am never going to be able to pull this off, Matthew. <laughs> I thought to myself, this has got to, I'm never going to be. But then after you, four hours in makeup, you're there at 4.30 in the morning, and poor, poor Michael Westmar, but what a great man, um, great makeup artist. And then at 9.30, it was five hours, 9.30 to the set. You worked 9.30 at night. It was a long, long day. And you think, no, you just, you have to um, be as grand as these characters in Star Trek are. I mean, they're all bigger than life. And they all, and, and what I love about that, the whole notion of Star Trek and 
the next generation and deep space nine and the the whole venue that this is because it represents all of us the good the evil the kind of mealy mouthed can't really find uh, a platform one way or the other uh the the very very weak the very very strong the bullies i mean it brought in everybody and then they gave them a different face or a different body but the the whole plot is what we live it's so it's 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 always blown me away that these people could I mean, you have to keep up with the, the, I don't know how you do it, Matthew, to be perfectly honest, because I don't know how I do it either. <laughs> I, I don't know how you do it because there's, it's like elevate. I mean, it's like, to me, it's like calculus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, it's like you were saying before, I mean, we, you know, us Star Trek fans, we live in this world. So, you know, to yeah. us, it's just second nature. It's we, we are instinctually part of it, you know, and you, you get a little taste of it. You want some more. Isn't that wonderful though? That's wonderful because if, um, because it was all so new to me, you know, I knew all of the words and, you know, you know, Patrick Stewart, he'd seen, you know, his work and then um, Captain Kirk, the, the original, yeah. uh, just went to space, God love him, with Bezos. I mean, really, talk about life coming full circle for yeah. that, for Captain Kirk actually going up into space. I mean, you can't write that stuff. You can't. Right, come a long way up. since uh, Gene Roddenberry, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, long live everyone um, that believes in dreams, that yeah. believes in space, that believes in the stars and the universal energy out there, that none of us would be here if it wasn't for that universal energy. That big bang, I guess everybody talks about. But I see it anymore. This episode is the distant origin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the distant origin. The distant origin. Since you mentioned Michael Westmark, too, I want to actually ask you a little bit more about that makeup because uh, I think it's safe to say this was probably the most prosthetics you've ever done in your entire career, right? Um, or am I missing something? No, no. I Let's see. Uh, yeah, that would have to be it. Um. Yeah, that, that was it. I don't remember seeing you as a giant dinosaur in King of Queens. I know that much. <laughs> no, King of Queens, no. Oh, my God, that hot dog scene with Kevin James. Oh, Lordy. Another wonderful uh, actor, smart guy. Um, it was four hours of the makeup chair each time, basically? Yes, wow. it was. Yeah, three days in a row, 4.30 in the morning till 9.30. And what they did was they, you know, they had this huge head. And then Blakemore, with his deft artistry painted the entire thing by hand and spray painted a lot of it mm. but talk about you know just i mean it was amazing what he created amazing what he created because then you find out that with depending upon the mood the of the voth the pigmentation the they they change colors, yeah. You know, green or orange or whatever. And I thought to my, that's so, it, it's so Italian for me because <laughs> you know when I get angry or whatever, the Calabrian comes out, and you don't want to mess with me. And you know when my mood changes, I change colors too. And so uh, the Voths, that species, did the same thing. And I just thought it was so funny, depending on their mood. They changed colors, and I thought, oh, so here I was, and he read on all of that, Matthew. He researched that, you know, he researched everything, and then he went with his gut and with his own innate talent and his artistry, and it all came together. It was magic. It was just magic what he did. From when I sat there to the, when I got up, and then I had to do the full contacts which was a killer that was the yeah. killer for me and then they I heard our stories about those contacts oh i mean well you had to go to an ophthalmologist first to be sized and whatever and then at lunchtime they'd say well consider um you know we're gonna have to take your contact i said 
don't come near me. And I had these, because the Voffs had these long, you know, uh, fingers with the nails at the end. <laughs> I had those put on and, and I'd look, don't come near me, guys. Don't come near me. I'm not taking these things out because I don't want to put them back in. I'm just going to live with this for the next 12 hours. And I did. <laughs> but um, to get the, the I, it was easier um, as each day went. You know what I mean? But I had never worn contacts. I never wore contacts in my life. And I kept thinking, isn't there kind of like a, a close-up glass I could wear or some kind of whatever? No. No, you had to do the real thing. And that's what I loved about working on the Voyager was the authenticity of it. And what uh, they really went to the mat, as yeah. did John Young for China yeah. Beach, yeah. you know, as, as Bowie did when he worked. Everybody, those pros that I worked with and was lucky and very thankful to have worked with all of those pros, the writers, the actors, the directors, the actresses, the producers, the costume people, the makeup, the crew, transportation, everybody, everybody went to the mat. Nobody was, excuse me, nobody did it half-assed. They just dove in, got wet all over, and worked their hearts out, really their hearts out, to make a beautiful, beautiful production. Every single solitary episode every single solitary performance. And that's, you know, I've worked with a lot of wonderful, as I say it over and over again, but pros, pros. And yeah. you know, you know, I, I don't think I've, no, and I've, I've worked a lot and I'm very grateful. But I can't remember, everybody was act professionally that I worked with. Every single person I worked with. That's good to hear. At least, you know, no, no bad news is good news, right? No, 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 no bad news is good news. Yeah. No, no, there was no bad news. It was all good news because I was living the dream. And I don't think you can ask anything more than that, Matthew. You're living your dream and you're sharing your dream with me. And I thank you for that. Really, I do. And for oh, your patience, you. because we were trying to do this interview for the last year and um, the last two months, and today with our sound and sound check with Norman, sound checking and the visual and everything, we made it happen. Yeah, That's I'm very cool. grateful for that because I'm I'm loving this time. I'm getting to spend with you today too. So thank you for not giving up on this either. <laughs> oh, never, never give up, darling. Just keep on fighting. Yeah. Are there anything? Is there anything else you'd like to ask? Oh, I got I, plenty more things. But I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it tight here. But I do want to ask you if you remember okay. this. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think this one might be a memory that stands out to you. I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, do you remember the first time you actually saw yourself in all that makeup? <laughs> I mean, again, we're talking about this is a role. It's very different. Oh. I mean, you're now a walking dinosaur. Do you remember <laughs> that day at all? Yeah, I. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I I didn't have that. I had, well, the 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 funny story. My my husband came into my dressing room. I was married at that time. And my husband came into my dressing room and um, I was, well, do I say this? Yes. Well, I was in my underwear because I took off my costume and then there was a knock on my door and I thought, oh God, now what? You know, I'm in my underwear. And should I, I'll just say, who is it? And it, it was Norman. I said, hey, okay, Norman, come in and come in quick so no one sees. So he comes in my dressing room. He sees me in this gigantic head <laughs> that I couldn't take off. My long talons, nails, and the, the rubber gloves that they had given me, and they were also painted. He also painted that, spray painted and painted by brush. And there I was in my underwear with this gigantic dinosaur-like head. And, of course, the first thing my husband did was took a picture. I have no idea where that is, but it has to be the funniest darn thing um, I've ever done. It was, and the weird thing was, um, some of the people had, they'd known that I was going to be there, okay? And some people that I'd worked with before at Paramount. And so they'd come and visit me, and they would, and then I, there, it wasn't really, they were visiting Odala, so I was just talking to them like there was just nothing going on and, and everybody would just turn but when you worked on those programs 
when you worked on all those programs, nobody turned. Everybody thought, you know, oh, well, another alien is going by or there's a Ferengi and there's a, a Borg and there is a Voth and there's so no one. But the ones that um, that that were new, sometimes the extras and whatever, I mean, they were just in awe, their eyes. But I was in shock. I was in just shock. Shock at the artistry, mainly of any of, and then thinking, "Oh dear God, my biggest fear, Matthew, was is my head going to fall off?" <laughs> and because when she got big and she got, um, and she had to hit that back wall, uh, as that you know that old theatrical term, hit the back wall, so everybody's able to hear you. Well, you got mics, you got boom, you got. It's not that you're never going to be heard, but I thought, what if my head falls off? Dear God, what if my head falls off? I mean, you go through the most ridiculous um, imaginations that um, you don't even, and you have to say, cancel that thought, delete that thought, and your head is not going to fall off, Consetta. You're just going to have to, you know, as Spencer Tracy said, you know, know your lines and don't bump into the furniture. And that's absolutely (laughs) true. That is so basic, so basic. And... What did he tell Burt Reynolds? Spencer Tracy, when Burt Reynolds asked him, and it was the courtroom scene in Inherit the Wind. And um, he said, well, I'm I'm a young actor, Reynolds said, and he was on the lot. He was watching that scene that they were filming, the trial scene uh, that day. And he said, well, can you give me any tips on acting, Mr. Tracy? And he tells Reynolds, uh, yeah. He said, just don't let anyone catch you doing it. And I just thought, everything. Yeah. You know, it's not about acting. It's about hopefully reacting, living, being in the moment, in the character, you know, believing it all. And it's that, that magic moment when everything all comes together. And if without Michael Blakemore, Odala would never have happened. And it's uh, it's Michael Westmore, just to remind you. Oh, not Blakemore. I'm yeah, sorry. And thank Reverend, you. West, thank you. Um, Michael Westmore, the great Westmore uh, family, the makeup artist, Michael Westmore. But if it wasn't for Michael Westmore, Odala would not have existed. He mm-hmm. helped me to create that character. And the costume, obviously the costume people as well, you know, because once you get into the skin of, for lack of a better word, in the robes of those beings that you're supposed to portray that are not like you at all, some are similar, some are so vastly different than your own, um, then you can create anything. But if it wasn't for... Michael, I don't know. I don't. I, when I think of it, he made me bigger than life, and so I just kind of walked into that world and into that painting that he created. It was like a Monet, really. I mean, what he did was like a Van Gogh or Monet. It was there. I was ready to go. All you could do was frame that head alone. And, well, uh, I think some of the credit we can also give to uh, some of your scene partners because you got to work exclusively, more or less, with Henry Warnitz. Uh, he was Gagan, and uh, well, I, I mean, you were, you were sharing some scenes with guys, including Robert terrific. Beltran and yes. Chakotay, but but Henry, uh, you know, you and Henry had wonderful on-screen partnership there. We uh, really got, did. We really yeah, did. Jeez, I haven't. We really, both you honestly stole the show. I mean, Chakotay's there too, but you guys are far more important. Oh no, absolutely. And who was the other one? Um, the other one that was the small. Oh. I forgot his name too. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put he, up an interview. Had, it, it was uh, my my husband would know, but she he was on when you had the woman that had uh, a really short Judy Dench haircut, and there was all those uh, Star Trek people on, and they were and they he played a Ferengi. Marmon, Ma, oh, Armin Shimmerman. Yes, yeah, he was. a Wonderful, wonderful actor. But Henry, yes, and I haven't seen him since. We had wonderful repartee going back and forth and back. I mean, really talk about wills yeah. uh, and and respect. 
respect, not as actors, but with those characters, a real um, resonated with both of us. And then it exploded. It was like a, you know, starburst, really. Whenever I was doing a scene with him, it was never, you know, it was never kitchen table talk. It was really life or death for Odala yeah. and, may, and more for Gagan. So he had to back off, but he really, he fought the good fight. It was, it was, yeah, I love doing those scenes with Henry. Is he still with us? Yes, he is. He's still alive. I believe he is, and hopefully I'll have him on the show at some point, too. That's, that's oh, that would be lovely. That would be lovely. Now, this episode was directed by David Livingston, and uh, he's one of the guys who has shot the most Star Trek episodes of all time. It's over 60 episodes across the franchise. Wow. Uh, so, you know, I'd love to know if you can remember working with him, and more importantly, uh, I, you know, I don't know if you've watched the episode or not, but if you have, uh, you know, I'd love to hear what you thought of his direction, because for me, uh, this episode stands out, and I'm still a bit mixed by how I feel about it, because in particular... The scenes with Henry and with yourself, a lot of them are shot at like these Dutch angles. There's some weird choices. They're kind of very extreme tight shots of your face. And part of me like wonders why, you know? So I'm curious, you know, if you remember anything from David and what you thought about the choices he made on this episode. Well, um, I think he trusted me. And boy, if a director doesn't trust you, you're dead in the water. Dead on the set dead on stage, <laughs> wherever you are, the director doesn't trust what you're doing. Um, uh, you don't feel that you're, um, you're not playing in that sandbox. Mm. Okay. You're kind of watching from outside the sandbox and you really want to get in and play, but they're not allowing you to play or they're allowing you to play only by the rules. And I always felt that David trusted me. And I think that's why those, um, I think he approved of what I was, what I, the choices that I was making for Odala. And then I think he felt safe and I felt safe with him with coming into those close-ups and at those weird angles, because I think he respected the fact that I was a stage actress. Mm. And that I came from New York and I wasn't necessarily a film or a television actress. I was primarily a stage actor. That's where I learned all of my uh, whatever. And there's always more to learn. And you know, acting is a work in progress. Uh, so, so is living, by the way. But um, yeah, I always felt that he trusted me. And so I just, it was a dance that we did. Because I, um, he would always let me know how he was going to shoot something, which was really uh, very generous of him to do so. And, um, but he, I never got any um, direction to, as to Odala. I think I, I would hope I nailed her. And he thought the same. And so he trusted me with what, with my instincts. And so when he would bring that camera in, he would let me know, well, I'm going to take it from this and this and this, because I think he wanted to see, she was like a, uh, a prism. Mm. And, and when the light <clears throat> or the camera shown, not only it, it, it not only activated Westmore's work, it zoomed in on Odala on who, on Odala's work and Concetta's work, which are one and the same. And I think that was like, there was all different angles because she was a prismic character. She was like looking at a prism and if the light falls on one side of the prism, it looks brighter and the other one looks darker. And that's how she was. She, her mood, she was focused and she was a strong character beyond strong. She had the strength of ages. <laughs> in her background, but there were so many different sides of Odala that I saw her as a prism. And I think uh, David used those camera angles prismically. She, he came on different, so many different sides. And, uh, and that's how I think made it work. And he also didn't get, he didn't get in my way. Um, mm -hmm. 
and he didn't get in Odala's way. And he was such a wonderful director because he trusted his actors. He really trusted his actors. And that's half the battle, Martha. Half the battle. Yeah. So I felt very comfortable in um, working with him. Now, did you watch the episode when it first aired? Um, or I should say, have you watched it at all, maybe? Yes, I have watched it at all. Uh, I well, I brought my <laughs> my high school girlfriends here that had not visited Los Angeles in 2017, and I said I have a media room, and I said, well, you know, some of they were raising kids while I was acting, right? So I know a lot of the stuff that I did on television. Um, they didn't see, so I said, well, you want to watch Minister Odala? And they said, well, yeah, I mean that Star Trek thing? I said, yeah, it was really the voyage. So they were like, just. It was for an hour, and it was quite wonderful because there was like no talking. Nobody ate popcorn, and I always served popcorn when I had people over to watch a movie. Nobody, they were just <laughs> absolutely blown away, and that's what makes it so much fun to yeah. do what we do as actors. You know, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As long as you can learn something, and kind of be taken away for a while from the 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 sadness of and the energy in nationally and globally if we can as actors as you know the players are coming the players are coming it's like magic for an hour or a half hour and that's how you sh you share the gift you, sh you give it and then you get it back like a letter from your student that said, gosh, I remember we studied poetry with you, Miss Tomei, and I'll never forget uh, that you would play a James Taylor song and when we were studying poetry. And then we would analyze the poem of his songs. So it all comes around, Matthew. Yeah. It all, it, you hope it does anyway. And in only the best possible way, and also to encourage young actors, you know, to not give up their dreams. And it's so much harder now with the COVID restrictions and the virtual, oh my gosh, what virtual auditioning process that goes on. I mean, how can an actor go in and take a room? There's no way that they can take a room in a virtual audition. You just, it's not there. The energy is different, you know, the uh, camaraderie is different, the, the focus, everything is different. It takes away a lot of the creative process and the excitement of going into an audition and meeting the producers and the directors. I mean, and poor Norman has to hand me, you know, I have to say, Norman, can you give me a little something? I know you're giving me my cues, honey, but can you just give me a little oomph? <laughs> give me a little more than what you're giving me, kid. Um, my poor, my poor Norman. But um, your acting partner, he's uh, our technician here for this. Yes, episode yes, he's my, Oh yeah, he's my everything. He's my everything. I give him a hard time a lot because um, we married so much later, and because of the Calabrese, and because of the Roman. Um, it's so funny because when I saw Tucci's, you know, uh, searching for Italy, and he was in Calabria. Okay. He went to Calabria, he went to Liguria, he went to Emilia Romagna, he went everywhere. But he went to Calabria. And that was, I have not been, I've been to Italy and whatever, but ha Calabria. <laughs> she went into this restaurant, this Italian woman, she was Calabrese. She had just cooked over and she said, Stanley, the women here, they rule. They rule the women. No the men, the Calabrese women, they rule. And he burst out laughing because he had said that the Calabrians, just in the dialogue, he said they were, they were the Phoenicians and the Greeks and the Moors. They invaded them, right? So they were always fighting to stay alive, fighting for themselves. And that's why they were so tough. So he said, you just don't want to mess with the Calabres. And I just thought... Oh my God, I remember my mother being so strong like that, my aunts. And I thought, that's true, you didn't want to mess. So what can I say with Steve LaManna? Um, 
he I told mean, this is why you were perfect for Minister Odala, because really yes, the boss yes. is and, crazy. So that's really well, it. The Calabrian helped me do that, that whole Italian, um, that bigger than life thing. But Lamana said, so Norman, Lamana has told me he doesn't know what hit him in Zeta. Norman doesn't know what hit him. And then Norman says to Lamana, I sleep with one eye open, Stevie. I sleep with one eye open. <laughs> And they go on and on. So, but it's great fun. It's great fun. All right. So, Conchetta, let's, uh, as we come to our conclusion here, I got a few lightning round questions for you. I call them lightning round, but they always take longer because they're like real deep thought stuff here. Let, let's see how it goes here. So, okay. Uh, let me start sharp and top here. Best day on a set and worst day on a set. <laughs> oh, Lordy. And ideally, stories that won't get you fired or blacklisted. Okay. Um, oh. Well, I thought I was going to be fired. Um, there was a union strike going on, and I was coming in to China Beach. And we, our outdoor locations were Indian Dunes because that was similar to the lower hills in Vietnam. So that's where our location was, Indian Dunes. And there was a strike going on. And uh, so I crossed strike lines, as all the actors did. We were had call time in. And the strikers threw nails um, in, uh, <laughs> in the driveway of me entering onto the set location of Indian Dunes. And all my, all my tires went, all four of them. So I had to get out of my car, and I went, and John Young... God love him. God, John Young, John Sacred Young, the creator of uh, China Beach, he was directing this episode. And I walked in, he was directing, there was actors, camera was going, and was. And I said, what's up, John? What the hell is up? I got four flat tires, and by the way, I'm not paying for them. I have, They're all nailed in, and I cannot believe we have to cross picket lines to come to work. So what the hell is happening, John? I just, then I thought, oh, my God, the color braids came out. Talk about nails. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to be fired. Yeah, I'm going to be fired, Consetta. He's not going to take that. And he'd say, cut. Okay, Concetta, we'll pay you. We'll, we'll give you the, get your four new tires. We'll give you a ride home because I couldn't get home with four flat tires. And he said, we'll reimburse you for four. Now I said, can we continue the scene? And I said, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. That was one of the worst days. Although I wasn't acting. I died, kind of thought I would be fired that day because um, my flat tires. The best day, one of the best days, um, uh, on the set was, um, let's see. Oh gosh, this is all. Wish I had known these questions, Matthew. I warned um, you, the lightning round is not as easy as it sounds. No I know the lightning round isn't. I'm such a liar. Uh, uh, the best day was getting to know and meet Betty White. Oh, well, we love Betty, Betty White's White. story for the show. Betty White guest starred uh, on Providence. And um, I had met her before at other animal events, you know, raising money. And she asked me to if I would raise uh, help raise money for the SPCA LA. And after meeting her on the show, and um, she was just well, there are no words to really fully explain Betty. It's just that she was one of these angels. You know, my mother would say, "All the angels aren't in heaven, Holly. They're." right here in front of you. And Betty White was one of those women. I mean, when you knew the, the background and you saw the kind of uh, uh, life that she led, that was not without sadness and loss. Um, but I remember when I, um, we were talking uh, while the lights were being set up and I had lost my dad and I'm an only child, and um, Betty White was an only child. And she said, you know, Conchetta, she said, you don't really lose them. You carry them right here. And she pointed to her heart. She said, you carry them right here, everywhere you go. You never lose them. 
and you just take them along with you wherever you go. So it's not a loss. They accompany you every day until you see them again on the other side. And I was like, the humanity of this woman would break your heart. The humanity of this woman. And funny and raucous, wicked sense of humor and very bright and like like mercury. Mm. Lightning. Fast. And just, and she so loved all of those fur friends, you know, those four footed or two footed or, you know, whether or birds or whatever. And apparently before she passed away, uh, she was so happy. A friend of mine uh, from Kenosha had uh, worked with her and was her script supervisor on uh, Hot in Cleveland. And apparently she was so happy that a family of ducks had landed in her pool. <laughs> and she could look out of her window and um and look at and watch them you know so see this little uh this little wonderful um skit in her pool of these little ducks and the mother duck and the ducklings and i thought that is so betty that's vintage betty um she had a heart bigger than any bigger than all the zoos that she helped support Mm. And um, all those animals, you know, um, were her best friends. And, you know, when you think that they do become your best friends. And she had such respect for that, their lives, you know, and everybody, you know, I remember Brian Denny, he telling, asking me, Denny was a good friend, name dropping, but I loved Denny. And we had our honeymoon at his home when he lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I remember him asking Norman, okay, Norman. And then I did two shows with Denny as well. So he'd ask, if a person was drowning and a cat was drowning, who would consider save? <laughs> Norman, I know the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah. Norman said, talk about a, a lightning rod question. And, and Norman said, Brian, she'd save the human being. And Brian said, yeah, I know. She's a good girl. But... <laughs> But that's, you know, Betty was just all heart, all heart, all heart. And that's why uh, that was one of the best days on the set when she walked on the set because she came at Christmas time, Matthew, and I had these ornaments made of my green dress, you know, the dead mother who came back in the dreams, Linda Hansen. And I had uh, a sculptor, an artist uh, who worked in sculpting um ceramics and I had the green dress that I wore as a Christmas ornament and I had tons of it made I had I gave one to all my cast members all my crew members and I had extras and Betty White was guest starring and so I gave her that it was a Christmas I said this is my Christmas present to you and I saw her then later on after the show canceled at Petco going and shopping herself for her own food for her dogs and her cats at Petco. And I said, she said, Conchetta, hi. And I said, hi, Betty, how are you? Fine, fine. She said, I have to tell you that Christmas ornament, that little green ceramic dress of Linda Hansen, she said, I saved it and I have it hanging on my shutters in Brentwood because oh. I had a hanger on the dress so you could hang it on the Christmas tree. Yeah. One in one in a hundred million, you That's know, awesome. a sweet soul and how, what a gift for all those years on this planet that she was able to give us. Oh, what a great gift. Yeah. I love hearing Betty White stories. I'll never get tired of those. And they, uh, we, didn't, we didn't come up in this interview, but a lot of times on this show, I have a lot of guests who have been on the golden girls. And I always ask them about the show. Oh, and Love wow. hearing about so it's great to hear you had a, a great connection with Betty White. Yes, that would probably be the most exciting day I had on the set. And when she asked me how it was working with the black spotted shepherd, uh, black spotted um, panther on China Beach, I worked with the cub. And uh, that was an amazing episode as well. But it was a black panther cub. It was six months old. 
And um, she said, how is it working? I said, well, it killed me, Betty, because um, they declaw them, you know, when they work in whatever. And I said, that just killed. She said, oh, really? She says, oh, God, I wish I hadn't asked you the question. I said, I have. I, I said, but I had to tell you the truth, but they declaw them, you know, so they don't hurt the actors or whatever. But she had such a connection with that world and our world and, I know she has an even more wonderful connection in the other world, in the next world, yeah. bringing her light to shine because she's shown it here for so many years and we basked in that warmth of Betty White. She's going to be a timeless actress for sure. Yeah. We'll be talking about her for decades to come. Oh yes. Yeah. Long after we're gone, Matthew. Yeah. So here. how about a uh, similar note, but different here. Uh, the role either on stage or screen, the role that you are most proud of, well, I would say The Normal Heart with Brad Davis. Um, the play I did, uh, Linda Laubenstein, who was a doctor um, in the 80s in San Francisco who discovered the AIDS virus. And I played her in Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart for Joe Papp at the Public Theater. Um, there were a lot of... That was an unbelievable uh, experience because there were men uh, in that audience that were afflicted with AIDS. And I played that, uh, Emma Bruckner was the character's name, but Linda Laubenstein was the real character who died at the age of 45, the doctor who discovered AIDS in 1981 in San Francisco. So, um, yes, working with Brad Davis, uh, another consummate, consummate actor, another great good-hearted guy and one who had to fight so many addictions. You know, he fought, you name it, he fought it. The only thing he couldn't fight was uh, smoking. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, he had Dunhill menthols during rehearsal. So that was, um, that was tough. But I mean, he spoke d drug addiction and alcohol addiction and whatever. And then um, no one knew that he had AIDS and we were all working, you know, together, but no one knew what was happening. And he got that, he got that um, diagnosis in the mail at the public theater. And it was in shock. You know, I mean, it was like, no, his, his wife did, um, Bluestein, the casting director, Susan Bluestein. And she got it in L.A. He was in New York at the public and we were working and she got it. And that, that was a shock for her. And that's when you know, he let the, left the show. But we didn't know anything. We knew that long after he passed away. Nothing. We didn't know why I left the show, that he had done it. I did it. It ran. Joe Pat ran it for nine months. I did it for seven months. Five months with David, uh, with Joel. Two months with Joel Gray. And five months with Brad Davis. That was, that was probably... Um, that really was the most memorable thing because it was happening. AIDS was alive and well, unfortunately, in New York in the 80s. And I was doing it in 1985. And so there would be groups of um, young men coming to watch the show. And um, I went to lunch. Uh, they asked if we would go to lunch with them. And I said, yeah, I would. So I went and David Brooks went um, to lunch with a group of people that uh, came to see the show. And they all had AIDS. Every last one of them at that table did. And they were all bright, beautiful men and really smart, all educated, um, funny, sensitive, and, and very, very bright. And it was such a service. I felt like I was doing a service. I left a Broadway play to do it. I left Noises Off, working with Carol Shelley um, at the time. And uh, I was asked to audition, and I auditioned for Mr. Papp, and I auditioned for Brad Davis. Um, and I never thought I'd get it either, because she was a dwarfed woman. Linda Lovenstein. She had polio. She was in a, you know, she was uh, very small and she was in a wheelchair to begin with. So these guys were rehearsing, all the my guys, um, Don Moffat and um, Brad had been rehearsing 
with David Brooks and everyone else for two or three weeks because they couldn't find Laubenstein. They couldn't find Dr. Bruckner, a character. So I came in and auditioned and got it, left noises off. But I thought it was just... An, <laughs> that experience, Matthew, going on stage every night, knowing that, you know how you have to make it real? You didn't have to make anything real. It was real. And these people, all these brave souls that were in the audience, every night, every matinee, were living it. Living it. So to me, it was, I felt like I was kind of helping them to accept it. I felt like my contribution, uh, as small as it was, because it was little did we know what a great play. Uh, we knew it was a great play at the time, but little did we know the um, the outcome of this play that would then go to, you know, HBO and Julia Roberts and Mark Ruffalo would do The Normal Heart, and then they wanted Streisand, Larry Kramer wanted Streisand to do the film, and then it didn't do that. It went into HBO as a TV movie, which was fine. Uh, but the fact that the story was told, I really felt that I was, I really felt part of that whole painful time and trying to give some kind of healing. Mm. It was one of the most, um, I think I would like to think that I was contributing as part of the healing by going out to lunch with these guys, uh, the ones that were so affected uh, by Kaposi sarcoma, and whose days were numbered. And then this was, you know, they would go out, there would be these groups of um, gay men's health crisis would get these groups together and they'd come to see our shows. And, you know, they were all, they were always so excited, you know, to see what was, not only that they were living it, and then, of course, he dies at the end at weeks. But, I mean, that, that's Larry Kramer's, uh, Donnie Moffat's role. Um, Ned Weeks' his lover dies at the end. And, but there was such a release. I always felt that we were creating some kind of balm, some kind of healing um, emotion, ointment, because it was all based on love. Mm. Whatever you perceive love to be didn't make any difference. It was a play about love. Loving a man? Yes. But it was still a play about love. Could have been it was a rom it was a romance. It had nothing to do with anything other than the huge crisis that was going on, but the whole the whole point of that was the heartbeat, was the normal heart. And that heart beats in all of us with whomever we love. And that's, uh, that's why it's important to remember, always to remember to be kind and always remember to be loving. So I, I felt that I was part of that amazing experience and I was very honored to be cast and included, to be able to experience that as it was happening in the 80s in New York City. That was an honor. It sounds like it's the kind of show that's probably stuck with you more than it has even with the audience because uh, it's just such an impactful moment in your career. So It was. It's, uh, it's a lot of carry. It was, it was also the, the last play, that, you know, that, that was before I came to Los Angeles. Hmm. I left New York then in 85 to come here and work at the Mark Taper Forum. But um, on stage again, which was wonderful. But that was a spiritual experience, Matthew. Normal yeah. art was a spiritual experience on all levels. Emotional, spiritual, uh, physical, because of the handicap that Linda Laubenstein actually had because of polio. And then she, I think she passed away uh, very young. Very young. She didn't live, you know, long at all. But boy, what she discovered and what Larry Kramer wrote about, that was his Mona Lisa. 
the normal heart because we are all we all have those hearts and we all beat as one and and so i was glad to be part of that heartbeat well that is a very heavy topic that i have no witty retort for so i'm just going to go to my next question because uh, okay. there's no good segue for this one uh <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, what's a lesson or a piece of advice that somebody gave you that you still think about or use to this very day? Now, on a, th- on a theatrical or a worldly or life, whatever. Yes. All of those <laughs> Either things. one, either one, basically, yeah. <laughs> All of those things. Okay. Oh, there's so many wonderful things. So many wonderful things. The most profound was... Being true to yourself and being, yes, being true to yourself Mm. and knowing that there's a power bigger than all of us that takes care of us. And my belief in that power some hit people call it so many different things i call it our lord but but there's a power more omnipotent than all of us that rules the space this wonderful place that we call earth and sometimes not so wonderful but my belief in god without my belief in god without my mother having given me her faith I would never be able to have tackled half the things in my life that I was able to not only compete, but complete. Um, Because I do believe in angels and I do believe in God. And I lead with, I think what's important to this lead was always remember to be kind. No, just remember to be kind and thoughtful of other people. I'd say it's definitely uh, a good way to kind of summarize a lot of your career professionally from what you've told me today is you've been around people who've been like that and you have in turn are also like that. So well, uh, you're definitely living proof of all that. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm still working on it, Matthew. <laughs> I'm still working at, um, on just, you know, being a better person. And, you know, it's, it's also funny because I've learned so much from my husband, right? A lot from my husband. <laughs> One of the things I've learned uh, besides uh, an unbelievable heart of of kindness, and magnanimity when it comes to other people and treating everybody equally, as he'd say, "Don't parade the horribles." It's hmm. a good way to put that. I just love that expression. You know, don't parade the horribles, and don't complain, and don't explain. <laughs> you know, sometimes we got complaining and then sometimes we find ourselves in a hole trying to explain too much when we shouldn't. Um, but she said, you know, it's all I'm going to don't parade the horribles. And, and not, and I, and also that, that whole mindset of that whole power of positive thinking people talk about, well, you know, it works. It works. Whatever those positive things are in your life, you know, Embrace them because they keep us all going because the center of all of that is love. It's just love. And that's why I love the word dog. No one loves dogs. Well, dog spelled backwards is love. (laughs) Because I think we were loved unconditionally and uh, dogs love you unconditionally. And besides, they're your best friends. Yeah. Betty and I believe our really best friends were really our fur friends. But uh, anyway... Norman, I'm stealing that advice too. Yes, but it's there's so many things, Matthew. When you asked me that, so many things came into being. But I think um, if you're true to yourself, then you know, um, as in Hamlet, you cannot be false to any man. Mm, very good. Now, you you had quite a career on the stage, on screen, and you're just a great person in general. Uh, oh, so yeah. you know. What do you want the legacy of Concetta Tome to be once Concetta is off this mortal coil? That I took the time. That I took the time uh, to 
answer a question that I took the time to talk to a person that no one would want to talk to, that I took the time uh, and the money, if I could, uh, and if I did, and I have, uh, to give to, just try to give as much back to the world as the world has given to me and to always remember to be kind. I think that's that's most important. My work, well, that speaks for itself, but Kinsetta, as long as I can hug somebody and they can hug me back and, and um, make them laugh, and I can't impress more um, about kindness because I think kindness and compassion uh, and giving of oneself as much as one can in the best of ways, in the most positive of ways, is, is a way that we will heal this planet and this division and this earth and, you know, but it has to begin in your home. It has to begin with children when they're young. It has to begin, you know, um, in the house. If you wanted to, if you want to throw that off to the world, it's got to begin in the home. And that's where it began in my home. And I hope that I'm going to share all of those wonderful things that my mom and dad gave me, um, with people who come into my path. What did Andre DeShields say when he won the Academy Award? That was the most unbelievable thing I've ever heard in any um, any uh, show, awards show. And, and I know I'm not going to be quoting him accurately, but he said, when someone asked him what his career was about, he said, it's the feeling that you get when people look at you and you and you when you enter a room and that's what people feel when you enter the room that light the light that you bring into a room that everybody feels that's what it was all about for him and I thought and I know I'm not quoting him accurately but if you can all YouTube what he said at the Academy Awards, that's it. That's really what it summed. You know that you were bringing the light into everybody else's lives and how happy they were to see you when you entered a room. Well, that says it all, doesn't it? Well, I would say that you have definitely illuminated our Zoom session today. Oh. So thank you for that, <laughs> Matthew. You what fun! You're just <laughs> adorable, and you're just so kind. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So much. I mean, really, this was such great fun, and well, you know, we got to come. I, I got everything. Yet. I hope I didn't go on and on. I have a tendency to do that, but I am no, not at all. I mean, you know, I was going to say this is, you know, I, as I was doing my research for YouTube, you know, there wasn't a ton out there with you as far as interviews go. So, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that I have now the ability to share my experience or built now and get really the whole story about yourself because it's about time it gets told out there the right way. And you know, this being Trek Untold, they do have to make this full circle. Uh, about Star Trek. So my last thing for you today, Conchetta, yes. uh, what's the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Oh my gosh. Well, it's a part of, uh, it's a part of history, isn't it? Mm, yeah. It's a wonderful part of history. And I played a, such a small part in it, but it was such a huge, um, I mean, Star Trek to me is like a planet in and of itself. Right? I mean, you talk about Earth, you talk about um, satellites and all sorts of planets, but it seems like the biggest, the, the whole thought of Star Trek and all of those characters and all of those lives and all of those beings and to be a part of that huge, huge dream that Roddenberry, I mean, had. Yeah. I mean, just, and that man was talking about genius. That Gene Roddenberry, my God. But for me, just to be a part of the Trekkie, <laughs> the Trekkie set, I'm, I'm very proud of that, actually. 
And I'm also glad that I was able to bring my theater training to Minister Odala and that I was able to, I was able to do a job that you appreciated, Matthew, that you would, that you would ask me to be on this lovely show. So I'm very proud of that as well. Oh, proud of Trek Untold. So just keep telling the, your stories, Matthew. Well, I'm it's here to tell your important. stories. And I mean, you know, we're talking about the story of the little girl from Wisconsin who never thought she'd be on Star Trek. And here she is with a career on stage across the entire globe. So, I mean, that's, that's the story. That's very sweet. And it's interesting. You should say that because my husband has always said that. Who would have thought that you packed your bags as an elementary school teacher, a junior high school teacher, left your hometown in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and worked with David Bowie and Kevin Klein, and it goes on and on, and Brad Davis, and, you know, my husband says the exact same thing. But see, that's, I guess, when, when you dream strongly enough, you know, like Jiminy Cricket says, you know, dreams do come true. But it isn't, it isn't luck. I want everyone to know that luck, as my husband always said, he said, what is that old adage you can say? He said, luck is the result of hard work. Mm. You got to make the opportunities. Absolutely. And get some hot tea and lemon. And thank you for giving of yourself when you're not feeling well today, Matthew. That was kind. Talk about well, being kind. Well, thank you so much, Conchetta, for hanging out today, talking with us. And you know, okay. like I said... Uh, there hasn't been a lot of interviews with you out there on the YouTube. I'm happy we got it now uh, and everybody can hear your wonderful stories because I, I love the way you describe things. You have such a visual way of speaking and such a teacherly way of imparting your knowledge on everybody here. So thank you for that. And just one last note for myself here too. You know, I, I really do enjoy your episode a lot. I told my girlfriend I was interviewing Minister Odala and she's like, oh, I hate that character. That's how good it was. <laughs> oh, I it's did my job then. That's, that's <laughs> perfect. I did my job. Well, you thank her for me, would you? I will oh, do. I'm going to thank you again right now for just uh, all this time today because we've gone on a long time and uh, you know I, I'm I could have gone on longer. I'm pretty sure because these are great stories and I'm happy that we get the Conchetta story out there now. So uh, again, well, I'm you, very darling. very grateful for this time with you. Today. Well, thank you, and I know uh, my mother and father would have said thank you as well and would have really appreciated you. Look where Holly is now. All right, absolutely. They're little. They're one and only. <laughs> thank you so much, Matthew. This is great fun. If I ever get to New York, I will definitely. Get in contact. We can go to a deli. We're going to whatever's open still. <laughs> okay, whatever's open is right. Safe and open. You take good care of yourself, Matthew. Thank you so much, Conchetta. Thanks for sharing my dreams and appreciating them. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, all one word. If you'd like to directly support this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold, which gives you access to some great perks that can't be beat. Or pick up some merchandise from our store, or use my Amazon shop link to check out all kinds of different Star Trek merchandise. Links for all these things are in the show notes. Shout out to Triple Fiction Productions for being a key sponsor of Trek Untold. Don't forget to check them out and all of the fine folks whose ads you've seen or heard on this podcast, too. If you have any questions, feedback, or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest or discuss sponsorship options for any of these episodes in the future, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope to see you here again as we uncover more untold stories from Star Trek and beyond and get to know even more amazing people who have contributed to this ever-expanding universe. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the RageWorks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.